Can I remind members, visitors and those in the public gallery to please ensure their mobile phones are switched off or in flight mode for the duration of this meeting as they interfere with the broadcasting equipment even when on silent mode? Pre-legislative scrutiny of the company's Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill. I would like to welcome Ms Justice Mary Lefoy, President of the Law Reform Commission and former Judge of the Supreme Court, Raymond Byrne, Commissioner, Law Reform Commission, Mr Paul Egan, Chairman of the Company Law Review Group, Mr Vincent Madigan, Company Law Review Group, and Ms Tara Keane, Company Law Review Group Secretariat. In accordance with procedure, I am required to read out the following. By virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I would remind our guests that the presentation should be no more than five minutes duration. Members have been circulated with the presentation submitted by today's attendees. I now ask Ms Justice Lefoy to make a brief introductory remarks and will then ask Mr Raymond Byrne to make the presentation to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, members of the committee. And we're very happy to be here and hopefully we will be able to assist you. Um, I just want to introduce uh, my colleagues. Uh, first of all, there's Raymond Byrne, who's the full-time commissioner um, in the Law Reform Commission. And he was there throughout um, the um, work period on uh, which ultimately became the report on regulatory powers and corporate offences. So he, he knows all about it. I uh, just became president of the Law Reform Commission um, when the uh, report was about to be published and I had the honour of uh, being involved in the launch of it. So um, I, we, I, I'm, I'm relying on um, Mr Byrne and we have um, some of our researchers here. We have Deputy um, Director of Research, uh, Robbie Noonan, and two two of the um, principal legal researchers um, who were involved in this particular report, uh, Leanne Caulfield and Morgan Hervey. You're Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for attending today. Mr Byrne. Thank, thank you, Chair and, and members of the committee. And again, very, very happy to be involved in this. Um, and in terms of how we hope that uh, we will assist with the uh, committee's uh, scrutiny of the general scheme of the company's Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill is that in some respects the report that we published last October does overlap with your current deliberations, but there's no doubt that some other aspects of our report which had a different focus may not uh, overlap. Um, nonetheless, we thought it was useful in the uh, written statement that uh, we might give an overview of the general report, but I think possibly uh, one of the areas where the committee might have a particular interest in terms of looking at the scheme of the bill would be in relation to the recommendations that we made concerning what we described as the core regulatory toolkit uh, that financial and economic regulators should have, and I might uh, focus on that. In, in terms of the background to uh, the report that was published uh, in October uh, last year, um, the background to that was that after extensive consultation on the content of our current programme of law reform, uh, which was approved by government in 2013, uh, a number of submissions asked us to look at the whole area of the regulatory powers of financial and economic regulators. And while the general background to the report, no doubt, was heavily influenced by the uh, financial crisis that emerged in 2008, a lot of the submissions that we um, uh, were sent in in relation to the consultation on that fourth programme also recognised that other than the central bank which has very significant regulatory powers there are other regulators that didn't have 
as wide a regulatory toolkit, uh, bodies such as Comreg, the Competition Committee, and indeed the uh, Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement. Although I know that in, in some of the literature there is a debate about whether you could describe the ODCE as a regulator as such, but it certainly has some of the attributes of um, a regulator. And we were also very conscious of the fact that while obviously we've uh, been through um, uh, huge uh, trauma as a result of the banking crisis. The, the next major crisis of systemic, systemic proportions for the state might not come from the banking uh, sector and therefore the focus of our report was not just on financial regulation but on other sectoral economic regulators as well. Um, we're very conscious that we're an advisory body so what we recommend and what we include in our reports, including draft bills, that these are matters, of course, for others to determine whether, in fact, there will be any law reform out of our recommendations. And, of course, that's matters for uh, members of th this uh, committee and uh, other members of the Oireachtas. We're aware that a number of recommendations of the uh, report are under consideration uh, at the moment. Uh, and on page three of the uh, paper that we uh, circulated to the committee, we just mentioned some of the main recommendations. The establishment of a statutory corporate crime agency, um, in the idea that financial and economic regulators should have the power to impose significant financial sanctions and have the power to make regulatory enforcement agreements. And as I mentioned, that may be an area that the committee would want us to um, uh, look at. We also looked at our existing fraud offences and made recommendations in relation to how offences under the theft and fraud offences might be amended and then also the question as to whether there should be um, a, the introduction of a statutory system of deferred prosecution agreements. I'll just make a, a brief comments on the proposal in the Commission's report on a corporate crime agency because to some extent I, I know from the deliberations already here there's been a, a debate around the overlap um, with the uh, reforms of the ODCE in the Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill. So the Commission's proposal on a corporate crime agency was really focused on issues such as major corporate fraud and corruption type offences and the need for a separate agency to examine those kinds of offences. So we certainly did not uh, make a recommendation really directly related to the reform of the ODCE and we were very conscious that that was already something that had been debated in the government's 2017 paper on measures to improve the effectiveness of the response to so-called white-collar crime. So we understand that that issue of a corporate crime agency, or it could be described as a serious fraud and corruption agency, that that is being considered by the group that is currently being chaired by the former Director of Public Prosecutions, James Hamilton, and we understand that that group is due to report later this year. Uh, when we looked at the issues to, as to what kinds of regulatory powers uh, regulators should have, we tried to describe six core powers that they should have. And of those, I think we mentioned towards the end of page four uh, of the paper that we considered it was quite important that all similarly situated financial and economic regulators should have the power to do two things in particular, to impose administrative financial sanctions subject to court oversight to ensure compliance with the relevant constitutional requirements, and those would be similar to the central bank's powers in that respect. And then the second issue would be to have the power to enter into regulatory compliance agreements or regulatory settlements. So we recognise that those are two very important powers because the literature in the area of regulation indicates that those are some of the most effective powers that regulators uh, can have. Now, I'm not going to uh, take uh, the committee's time up with the discussions that we have on uh, the issue of theft and fraud offences and deferred prosecution agreements or due diligence defences uh, in the time uh, that's available. But what I would conclude uh, is by saying that we attempted in the report to take account of international best practice approaches and in particular we were very conscious that both the OECD and the European Union had strongly advocated that financial and economic regulators should have at their disposal this effective regulatory toolkit and that key components of such a toolkit are the powers to impose administrative financial sanctions and to enter into regulatory settlements. And we recognised in the report that all the studies that we've managed to look at indicated that those were incredibly effective and efficient 
methods, particularly to get collective uh, redress mechanisms. And I think that's quite important in the context of consumer protection, um, that uh, other methods of uh, gaining collective redress don't seem to be as effective as these kinds of powers that we recommended. So, uh, Chair and members of the committee, thank you very much for your attention and, of course, we're very happy uh, to take questions if, if that's... Um, thank you, Mr Byrne. Um, I'll now invite Mr Egan, Chairman of the Company Law Review Group, um, to give uh, your presentation to the committee, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this afternoon, I appear as a Chair of the Company Law Review Group and beside me I have uh, uh, Vincent Madigan, who, like myself, is a founder member of the Company Law Review Group and the Review Group's uh, Secretary, Ms Tara Keane. Uh, the Company Law Review Group was established as, on a statutory basis by Section 67 of the Company Law Enforcement Act 2001 and continues under Chapter 4 of Part 15 of the Companies Act 2014. The Review Group consists of members who have an expertise in and an interest in the development of company law, including practitioners such as lawyers, accountants, chartered secretaries, uh, users of company law such as uh, business persons and trade unions, uh, regulators, that's implementation and enforcement bodies, and representatives from government departments, including the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation. A number of uh, professional and other bodies nominate members, and the Minister makes appointments as well. And the Secretariat is provided by the Company Law Development at EU Unit of the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation. Uh, we work to a work programme which is determined by the Minister in consultation with the Review Group, um, the Review Group presents its recommendations on matters in its work programme to the Minister. The Minister reviews the recommendations of the Group and then decides the policy direction to be adopted. Uh, members of the Review Group, other than the Chair, are not remunerated in respect of their membership. Uh, the Review Group, we meet uh, between two and four times a year in plenary session, with most of our work being carried out by committees, of which there are currently five. And they are related to corporate governance, corporate insolvency, a statutory committee, which is a standing committee dealing with ongoing matters, uh, a corporate enforcement committee and part 23 committee which is, relates to public companies which are dealt with under part 23 of the Companies Act. Our statutory functions are set out in section 959 of the Companies Act 2014 which include uh, a requirement to monitor, review and advise the Minister on matters concerning the Companies Act, the amendment of the Act, the introduction of new legislation relating to the operation of companies and commercial practices in Ireland, the rules of court, judgments of courts, issues arising from the state's membership of the EU, international developments in company law and other related matters or issues. And in so doing, we must seek to promote enterprise, facilitate commerce and simplify the operation of the 2014 Act, enhance corporate governance and encourage commercial probity. Uh, the bill, uh, the heads of which are under discussion today to establish the uh, new Corporate Enforcement Authority as an independent company law compliance and enforcement agency is one of several measures announced on the 2nd of November 2017 in measures to enhance Ireland's corporate economic and regulatory framework. This is pursuant to a policy initiative of the government rather than a proposal resulting from uh, one of the company law review group's reports. The bill, however, does include a number of provisions to give effect to certain of the recommendations in review group uh, reports or derived from those reports, and specifically uh, the review group's uh, report on shares and share capital, which uh, was prepared by, in the first instance by a committee of which I was then chair, uh, a report on corporate governance matters and uh, a report on the protection of employees and unsecured creditors uh, where uh, Mr Madigan uh, was the chair. Um, the, so uh, our uh, competence to, uh, to speak to matters today is focused on parts 3, 4 and 5 which deal with those uh, respective reports and uh, recommendations either contained in or derived from them. And just to to uh, bring you up to date. Uh, the, the, the way the review group has worked in the past has been on two-year programmes with a big report at the end of two years. Uh, and in the paper that I submitted in advance of uh, today's meeting, I uh, give a heading, uh, headings of the various reports that have been submitted. Uh, I took office in June 2018, by which stage 
the review group have produced 16 annual reports and eight special reports, most notably uh, the report uh, that gave rise to the general scheme of the Companies Bill, uh, which was published in 2007 and uh, eventually became law as the Companies Act 2014. Um, the, uh, that was probably the most intense period of work of the, uh, of the review group as it uh, refocused company law away from the minority of companies which were uh, public companies and instead focused it on, uh, on uh, the, the private company and that uh, resulted in a sort of section by section root and branch uh, reform of the law and the review group uh, feels a special affection for our 2014 Act. Uh, and that, uh, so, um, uh, most, most recently, uh, the review group delivered its uh, annual report for the year 2018 to the Minister in compliance uh, with the Companies Act, uh, and it contained a code of conduct that we applied for the conduct of our proceedings, uh, a submission on the review of the Limited Partnerships Acts, uh, submission on the Shareholders' Rights Directive 828 of 2017 and a report on the Uncontrolled Model Law on Cross-Border Insolvency. So, uh, Chair and members of the Committee, I uh, look forward to uh, discussing the Bill and, as I say, in particular, uh, the, uh, the heads in Parts 3, 4 and 5. Thank you very much, Mr. Regan, and, and j just, just to comment on the fact that members of the review group are not re remunerated in respect of their membership. You have done a, sap a substantial amount of work, and I just want to say thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Um, we'll open it now to questions to the floor. So who would like to start? Senator Riley, have you any questions? Uh, well... I was hoping to have more time. Okay, well, I can give you more time. Digest De what's been De said. De 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 Neville? Jumping in. Oh, just one, one, in, one, in one relation to it. Is there any potential crossover between the roles of the proposed corporate crime agency and the corporate enforcement authority? Is there a liaison or some sort of liaison with inter on the international side, given you have cyber and the internet and that kind of global side of things? Uh, Mr. Byrne, would you like to take that? Sure, um, uh, d Deputy. Um, in, in terms of overlap and liaison, there's no doubt that there would be very important liaison if there was to be a corporate crime agency established. Um, again, the report that we carried out uh, did a lot of consultation with people who'd been involved in um, uh, examining some of the very serious uh, issues that arise on the regulatory side and what we discovered from some of the regulators was that they were very uh, capable of examining those areas that they had functional responsibility for in terms of, uh, say, um, regulating banks and other yeah. financial institutions, uh, the Competition Commission uh, having functional responsibility to look at company, uh, to competition law, mergers, takeovers, uh, and various other bodies which have those kinds of economic, regulatory, sectoral areas to look at, but that what they all said as well was that there was a risk that even though they might be looking at all of those detailed areas, that there was a risk that certain areas, such as major fraud matters, which would not be within their uh, responsibility as regulators, that that could, in a sense, fall between the cracks. And that's why the Commission made a recommendation that uh, there ought to be an agency that would be responsible for looking at those areas. That would be quite separate from the ODCE as it currently stands, or the Corporate Enforcement Authority if it is to be established under this bill, because the Corporate Enforcement Authority would still just have responsibility for the enforcement of the Companies Act uh, as amended. Uh, so that was the issue that arose in the consultations that we had with a number of the regulators that we consulted with. And therefore, um, the conclusion that the Commission came at, and this was why it recommended the need for a separate agency that would be responsible for examining issues that fall outside the remit of the existing financial and economic regulators. And um, you might be able to answer this question, but in relation to communication between the, we'll say whatever agency, the, the, the agency who's auditing or, or the regulatory agency and the businesses in question, we'll take, we'll take what happened 10 years ago with the banks. What type of and again, you may not be able to answer, but what type of communication takes place? Is it real-time type data 
that they request, or are the systems that sophisticated enough that they can give them that type? Because 10 years ago, from my own experience in the private sector, what happened was the amount of communication of data was maybe two months behind, three months behind when the, work, the regulatory authorities were going in to look at it. Now, again, this is anecdotal from my own experience. And that one of the huge things that was done in the intervening years is to try and get the systems up to speed that it's almost real-time communication that when you go in you take a snapshot you can find out exactly what's going on as opposed to in three months time or four months time so to negate any risk is there any development around that if you cannot answer that question i fully understand i know it's quite broad but yes. this is a matter of interest well w one of the things we didn't do was look at how regulators regulate that was not part of our function we we wouldn't really be competent to do that w but one of the issues that certainly comes up when you look at the history of regulation in Ireland is the issue of resourcing. And that was one of the reasons why we added in our recommendation that in terms of the establishment of a corporate crime agency, that resourcing is a very important matter. Something that we are not competent to decide yeah. what is the level of resourcing. But I think those are the kinds of issues in terms of the expertise within any of the bodies, the existing regulatory bodies, the proposed body here uh, in terms of a corporate enforcement authority has its sufficient resources um, and would a corporate crime agency be given sufficient resources as well. So I think that was certainly something from the history that we know about in terms of certainly the financial crisis that there were issues around whether existing powers were being used appropriately but there was also no, no doubt another issue about whether there was appropriate resourcing for the bodies that were charged with responsibility for enforcing financial regulation in the state. So I think those issues around resources and then technology and the capacity of regulators to actually ensure that they have the information, that wouldn't be something that we could mm -hmm. comment on other than at a very understand. high level of resourcing. I suppose from a committee point of view, it would be something, again, I'm, I'm saying anecdotally, it may, not, it may be there already, that the organisations themselves would be framed in such a way and their systems would be framed in such a way as is possible, given they work in a commercial environment. We have to be mindful of that, that the systems would be set up in such a way that, that as much as possible real-time reporting could be generated. Now, that may be the situation today in 2019. Um, but I know that there, that was a problem at the time, that you're lagging three and four and five months, whatever it was at the time. So. Thank you, Deputy. Um, Minister Warren, if I could just ask you a question there. You spoke about, in your concluding comments, you spoke about international based practice, and you referred to that in this respect, both the OECD and the EU have strongly advocated that financial and economic regulators should have at their disposal an effective regulatory toolkit. And the key components of such a toolkit are the powers to impose administrative financial sanctions. Do you believe the heads of the bill that we are conducting pre-legged scrutiny on now um, will provide that? Is that too blunt a question? Of course, it's a matter for uh, the, the, the committee to decide whether the conclusions that the Commission made in its report um, should be implemented. But from our analysis of what the international um, best practice is, including a lot of reports that have been done by the OECD and also at EU level, uh, and also then we looked at uh, the most recent literature that we could find, uh, some of which have been um, uh, carried out by, uh, for example, Professor Chris Hodges in uh, Oxford. Uh, and that information and that research indicates that those kinds of powers are the most effective in order to generate the kind of results that would deliver as best as you possibly can the kind of regulatory systems that we all want to have, which is that organisations who are being regulated are living up to those kinds of standards, whether it's in terms of compliance with uh, company law or financial services law. So th that certainly was the evidence that we had from uh, a lot of the submissions that we'd received and the literature that we looked at. Thank and you. in that respect, I suppose looking at uh, the draft heads, it would appear that that isn't included, isn't. Is, is not included in, mm -hmm. in the draft heads. Uh, now again, we're very conscious that those heads are going into the 2014 Act, but I think our understanding would be as well that the existing powers in the 2014 Act, while they give extensive powers, for example, to company inspectors uh, appointed by the High Court, um, 
the ODCE and the proposed Corporate Enforcement Authority, as we understand it, would not have those powers. Okay. Thank you, because as you understand, we are at the very first stage of the legislative process, so any information that we can feed back to the Minister will be, um, you know, very important. Mr Egan, if I could just ask you a question, or Mr Madigan, whoever would like to answer it. Um, the general scheme does not include a number of recommendations made by the CLRG. Are there any in particular you would like to draw the Committee's attention to that you feel maybe they should have been given more consideration? Because as I said, we're trying to make this the best legislation possible and that's the role of this Committee, to scrutinise what's in front of us and then we welcome any feedback we can get from the experts on this. Um, um, Chair, I, I, what, look, we understand our, our function to be to monitor, report and advise and once we've uh, discharged that duty, uh, we, we don't tend to go and revisit uh, the matter because policy is a matter for the government, it's a matter uh, for the department. Um, and we, we produce our reports and mm -hmm. I think you'll find that the reasoning behind the various uh, recommendations in all the reports, uh, they're quite clear. Uh, they're, they're reasonably clear. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I could speculate, but... Uh, but could you, uh, could you advise us as people, I suppose, law, uh, you know, people that, lay people that don't have the same qualifications in relation to this, if you could advise us on maybe any one or two specifics that you feel might have been given further consideration, it would be helpful to us when we're compiling our report. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, well... <laughs> But well, I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, all I can do, Chair, is to refer to the various uh, submissions. Um, all, all of the reports, uh, I think, with the, with the exception of the one related to employees and uh, uh, unsecured creditors, are consensus reports where there would be a wide variety of views uh, expressed and eventually what we try to do is to achieve a consensus among the various constituencies that are represented and we deliver it to the Minister but we don't see it as our function to uh, to sort of revisit and to debate with the Minister okay. uh, when we've delivered our report. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Senator David? Yeah, thank you. Um, again, I, I certainly uh, welcome the report from, from the law uh, Reform Commission and uh, odds from the company's uh, law review group. Um, they're uh, very comprehensive, and uh, I've, like Dr. Riley here, reading through them here as as, as uh, we we talk. Um, ju just two points, and not to sound too crass or, or, or too the, the, to the point. Um, I suppose there's a general uh, perception portrayed in the media, as we're all aware that. Um, you know that that Ireland is soft on on corporate or white collar crime. Um, we're all reading the papers every day and we're listening to it every day of the week. So um, I'm just curious what your um, if if that perception is true uh, compared to our EU uh, standards and uh, our, our, our uh, other sisters in the EU. Um, so I'm just curious of your thoughts on that. And uh, secondly. Um, would you believe um, that the Gardaí have enough resources to tackle financial and, and uh, corporate irregularities and, and uh, um, criminal acts as well? Um, it seems to be something that has you know, been pointed up that we might be behind the, the curve in relation to that, particularly um, compared to maybe Britain or, or similar type countries. So I'm just curious of, of uh, your thoughts. You've spent a lot of time looking at this these uh, both these areas so I'd be curious of, of your opinions on, on both well, I'll, I'll have a go um, uh, uh, in any two straight questions yeah. two straight questions it's only yes. Europe, you know. so in, in terms of how we compare with other countries on if you like white collar or corporate mm. crime um, in, in terms of uh, the um, consequences of the financial crash and the banking collapse. I suppose what's of some interest is that, uh, looking back now, a number of very senior people in banking institutions were prosecuted under our existing fraud legislation, and some of them have received significant prison sentences. 
if you compare that with other countries, actually, um, we, we sometimes think about the states and Mr. Madoff. Now, Mr. Madoff pleaded guilty to certain crimes, but there have been very few, by comparison in terms of the size of some of the other countries that we're looking at, there have been very few prosecutions of very senior bankers. In fact, some of those countries began with the idea of having only financial settlements. And I know that we have made recommendations that regulators ought to have the ability to impose very significant financial sanctions on, on corporate entities. But actually in Ireland, what happened was that some of the most significant resourcing was put into criminal prosecutions and resulting criminal convictions. Uh, there have been some convictions very recently now in relation to some of the, um, uh, the uh, rate-fixing scandals in the, in the UK, UK, but they came yeah. actually very, very late to, to that. So mm -hmm. it, it's not that I want to kind of give us all a pat on the back of our heads, but at the same time, uh, we, we shouldn't be uh, saying that nothing was done in terms of white-collar crime. There's no doubt that there is an issue around resourcing, the Commission is not competent to talk about what level of resourcing the guards or the regulators ought to have. But as I mentioned before, that is so, certainly something that we said must be part of the equation, the appropriate resourcing of bodies. If they're being set up by legislation, if a, a new entity is being created out of the old ODCE, then the, a, a major question has to be the uh, appropriate resourcing. Um, so I would say that certainly in the past the perception was that white-collar crime or senior executives within organisations were not really being uh, prosecuted, but there's no doubt the experience in most recent years has been that there have been prosecutions and, con and convictions and very significant resourcing, as the Director of Public Prosecutions has pointed out recently, very significant resources of her office have been spent over the last 10 years in uh, bringing those cases to trial. So certainly all of those resources were put in place. Whether there are sufficient resources to address all of the issues that arise is, is, is another question, but there's no doubt that those trials that, that did go uh, to conviction, those were very expensive trials, but the state did spend considerable resources in, in that area. We did have the Minister before us last week in relation to um, the budget for the, for, for the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation for the coming year, and we did learn in the estimates that there will be an extra million um, applied to um, uh, this new statutory body that's going to be set up. We also did ask, we, uh, we pressed the Minister in relation, would there be enough finance available? And she did state that, you know, if the demand, if there was a demand for it, it would be made available. So in fairness, she did put those fears to rest last week, um, in fairness to her. Mr. Egan, would you like to comment on Mr. Madigan on that question as well? Uh, Senator, I, I, what I would say, there's, I can answer half of your first question. Thank you. Uh, I think that with regard to resources of Gardaí, I have no information and I, I wouldn't have, be competent to respond on that. Uh, the question, are we soft on corporate crime? Uh, the bit that I can speak about is whether I believe that the law we have in Ireland is uh, of a high standard compared with uh, OECD international standards, and I'm of the view that it is. And there are a number of threads that feed into this answer. Um, first of all, our 2014 Act was the result of an exhaustive section by subsection analysis of all of our existing company law and uh, historically of course we used to copy what the UK did and it, uh, sometimes we would you know, just copy it almost word for word but uh, more and more the law that we have our company law our securities law our insolvency law is in fact generated in the EU so uh, it's not to say, oh, it's up to the EU to do it, but there is a rigour in the drafting of the law. There's a, uh, and certainly, I think that the fact that there is this Companies Bill, if, you, if we go back to the report on company law and enforcement from 1998, one of its recommendations was that at least once every two years, there would be a Companies Bill just to, to do a bit of catch up. And this is an example of that, and all the little tweaks and fixes that are being done. So uh, certainly uh, I believe that the, the statute law that we have and the, you know, the, the whole 
body of companies legislation we have stands up to scrutiny for many uh, and any comparison. Yeah, I just I appreciate the answer, but I suppose, look, I don't know, it's some of the, um, like the one with the HSBC and the fixing of rates and that, like, you know, they're, they're severe enough to, to catch them, like, but, and again, Bernie Madoff and his Ponzi scheme, um, we're talking about Ireland, you're, you're, all we looked at was, you know, uh, not even a handful of, of people f facing um, shortage enough prison sentences for it. Our state was defunct nearly after, you know, we had to get bailed out or whatever else. So we're comparing chalk and cheese to a certain extent, like, you know, on, on, on how we have dealt with some of these guys. And you have a pile of other banks that there was, you know, they're, they're, I'm not going to start mentioning names, but like there are quite, 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 quite high profile uh, heads of banks that were described as running fiefdoms and all the rest of it, and they haven't got anywhere near going anywhere anywhere else apart from still having a good time uh, in Ireland. So um, I, I just, you know, I suppose it's not without merit, maybe. Um, look, there has been a big, possibly a big shift, I suppose, to, to uh, try and bring us up to speed a bit, but I'd say we're still a long, long ways behind. Thanks, Senator. Um, Senator Riley. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, thank you both for your presentations <coughs> and to welcome you. There is, as, as the previous speaker said, a sense out there that corporate white-collar crime does not get pursued in the same way as other crime. Um, I very much welcome the report and many of the recommendations in it. And you, you speak in specifically to two areas where you feel, you know, that the, the power to impose administrative financial sanctions of a serious quantum, like 10 million uh, or 10 percent of turnover, and 1 million to the individual, and the power to enter into regulatory compliance agreements. Uh, these are available to the central bank, but they're not available to the regulatory authorities. And I'd certainly think that we could make those suggestions. I would agree with them very much. I also very much like the idea of, of being able to do the equivalent of the Probation Act to enter into a stay of execution and see will a company clean its act up. Um, and that's not been in any way soft on, on, on white-collar crime. You know that there's a huge problem at the moment with insurance. It's not your remiss, but that we've called for an insurance fraud squad in the Gardaí, a specific one. So what you're speaking to here is another group of within the Gardaí who would be specifically looking at corporate crime. Now, would that corporate crime agency lie within the Gardaí, or would it be parallel to the Gardaí? How would it operate with CAB? Who would they answer to? Uh, if you could answer those questions. And then, I don't know if you're in a position to, to, to answer this question, but I mean, do you have any information available to you here, or maybe to be made available later, I'm sure we could look it up. What, how, how many convictions with serious consequence, i.e. prison sentences, have been made in relation to corporate crime in 2018, 17, 16, 15, 14? Do you know what I mean? I mean, are we, are we, are we, have we seen the benefit of that act in 2014 in terms of it having a net effect? The general consensus seems to be, and I speak again from somebody who works in both sectors, the, oh, there's a vote in the Senate, sorry, now I'm going to have to be very rude. I didn't rude want to interrupt you. And not, and not be able to be here for your answer, but I'll read the, the transcript if you don't mind. But just in terms of, of, of uh, that issue, you know, that, that we have had an impact and that it isn't the case that, yes, we have the laws, uh, as Mr Egan said, but are they being implemented, in other words, in the courts? So my apologies, I have to go and vote. Thank you, Senator. I'll certainly let Mr Egan talk about the enforcement of the 2014 Act, and I think I'm, I might be able to address some of the other okay, thank the you. matters. I have no... Uh, I cannot answer the, uh, the question posed, but if I, I am aware that the Director of Corporate Enforcement, or member of his team, who has... Uh, given evidence before this committee has provided some information. And I make a point that, uh, say, over the past 20 years, there's been a sea change in uh, rudimentary compliance with company law. 
for making sure that there's timely information it means that any one of us now are able to click onto a website now and in practically every case you'll be able to find the company's accounts names of directors there's that transparency there's an immediacy of information as well as that the uh, the Irish law as well as having uh, copied British law for many years we've introduced for example restriction of directors and just as a statistic that I know was quoted here where um, between 2007 and 2018 1,860 directors were made subject to restriction orders and more than 240 are disqualified and uh, it's not the same as sending people off to jail, but if you can get people off the pitch, or get people off the pitch unless they comply with conditions, uh, that, that has to be uh, a positive move. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bourne? Yes. If, uh, I think there were a couple of questions that uh, uh, Senator Riley asked in relation to the structure of the proposed corporate crime agency, which is separate from the corporate enforcement uh, agency. So. Um, uh, corporate enforcement authority um, so the proposal that the commission put forward would be that it would be a multidisciplinary task force type uh, agency um, that would bring within one roof um, the different kinds of skills that would be required in terms of investigation um, and prosecution all the way from if you like uh, end to end uh, in terms of investigation and prosecution uh, and there's no doubt that under the current arrangements, you, you have the guards with very specific skills. You have some of the regulators who'd be li liaising with the guards and making reports. You have, of course, a very skilled unit on corporate crime within the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. What the Commission was proposing in its report last October was that there could be an agency which would have all of those under one roof from the very beginning. And, and that was modelled very much on the model of the uh, Criminal Assets Bureau on CAB. So it's not that it would be reporting to CAB, but that the model would be comparable to the CAB type of model, that it would be a uh, multidisciplinary and a task force type agency. Um, I, I think it is very clear that in terms of <clears throat> compliance with company law, um, there, there's been, uh, as Mr. Egan has said, a sea change in the last 20 or so years. If we were looking at um, uh, prosecutions outside of the company law uh, area, again, uh, the number of prosecutions that we see uh, being talked about in the courts where executives of companies who are engaged in tax fraud, um, uh, in tax evasion, who are actually getting prison sentences, who are being prosecuted under regulatory uh, powers of different regulators, there is no doubt that very serious convictions on indictment uh, are being brought. There may not be a huge number of people who have served prison sentences, but I think, again, we need to look at that in the context of the overall regulatory approach that criminal conviction ought not to be regarded as the only mechanism by which we uh, ensure that our compliance with legislation of a regulatory type is ensured. And so the other proposals that the Commission uh, looked at in its report were recommendations looking at all of those other aspects, as well as tightening up on some of the areas of criminal law that the Commission examined as well. Mr Byrne, one of the key recommendations in your report was in relation to a statutory corporate crime agency um, should be established and the dedicated unit in the um, office of the Director of Public, Public Prosecution should be maintained and both should be properly resourced. Um, do, do, do you think, is that in working in collaboration with the ODC then, is, 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 do, you, do you think that's the, the way forward? Yeah, there's no doubt that I think what, what needs to happen is that, uh, as far as the Commission would be uh, recommending in, in the report, is that uh, the, the existing regulators can engage in very good coordination between each other uh, in terms of some of their overlapping responsibilities. And that is certainly something that is done and can be done through various mechanisms, sometimes in legislation, sometimes through memorandums of understanding, MOUs, uh, and that is certainly something that uh, I think works uh, quite effectively in a lot of situations. In terms of the corporate crime agency, there is no doubt that if it does have those kinds of skill sets within uh, one roof, then they can work very effectively with the existing regulators, and that would be extremely important, as well as the issue of proper resourcing. 
Okay, thank you. And just another final question, um, just going back to the heads of the bill again. Like, uh, we know the ODCE came under the Department of Business, Enterprise and Innovation, and what this bill is proposing is that it will be a statutory body in its own right. Do you welcome that? Do you think that's the right way forward? Maybe Justice May Lefoy might? Well, I, I do. I think it's a, it's a very good idea. And in fact, it's really, I suppose, the uh, head in the scheme that is of most interest to us. Um, be, uh, it, 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 it would be appropriate to have a statutory body which was independent of the department and what is in Head 7, I think. And Head 8, I think, reflects the 2014 Act largely. But I do think it's a very good idea. Personally, I do. Right, it, yeah, yeah. That's, and would you feel the same as well about that, Mr Regan and Mr Madigan? Well, uh, again, I'd have to say that the review group itself hasn't uh, formed... Uh, a An view opinion. on this, yeah. but I would say that uh, in the abstract, anything that uh, assists in company law enforcement is a good thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, have we any further questions? Um, one, one, one quick question. Um, it was stated. It was stated in some of the submissions made or, or some uh, some time ago that because of what happened. 10 years ago, there was actually collapse, there was a collapse of institutions. There was a collapse of an institution, and obviously the regulatory bodies probably didn't have the wherewithal to be able to deal with that. Where are we now in relation to that, if that was to happen tomorrow? The, the collapse of the financial... Just, no, 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 yeah, there was a financial institution yes. collapse, and it was stated the last day that the, the, the body itself did not have the capacity to be able to deal with that doomsday yes. scenario, because... Yes. Obviously, it was never envisaged that that doomsday scenario would happen, but it actually yes. did. And now, in hindsight, if that doomsday was to happen tomorrow, in your opinion, where would we be? If you're well, able to answer, again, it may be a that, bit that, broad, that, that would be a bit outside yeah. of what the com Commission uh, looked at in its report, although one, one of the things that, or many things that did happen after 2008 is that not just at national level, where very significant new powers were given in 2010 and then following that in 2013 to the central bank, but also at EU level, issues around the supervisory mechanism that now comes out of the European Central Bank, where the pillar banks are being looked at very, very closely, and also where rules about the capital ratios and the ratios that the banks actually hold, those have certainly been strengthened at EU and, and international level. So that there, there have been significant responses there. It, it may very well be, I suppose you could say two things. One, that the, the next crisis may not be in financial services, but that insofar as the regulatory system, both at national level and at EU level, in terms of the single supervisory mechanism uh, reforms, that those have certainly strengthened the capacity to uh, actually intervene earlier uh, before there would be a, a collapse, and that there is specific legislation in the financial services area to deal with liquidations of, of banks, and uh, before that actually happens to address issues like capital ratios. So I, I can't say in particular that the Commission examined th that issue, but we'd be uh, ver have been very conscious as we went through our analysis that a huge number of reforms had to take in place. But the, the other aspect of this is, of course, that in terms of the, the regulators that are involved uh, in uh, enforcing financial and economic regulation in Ireland, uh, our analysis was that they all needed a core set of regulatory tools uh, and the ones that we mentioned in the, in the submission uh, to, to the committee would have been the ones where we felt that there was a gap in some of those okay. regulators. So that would be certainly something that we found from, from the literature uh, and that I think is quite important in terms of, of uh, prevention. Okay. Okay. Um, that concludes all of our business on today's agenda. Unless anybody would like to make a closing comment, are you all happy? Um, I'd like to apologise again for the members that had to leave to go and vote. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the business. It happens the whole time. Um, I would specifically like to thank Justice and Lafoy for being here again. She's no stranger to committee rooms. Both myself and Deputy Neville were on the... Um, we have just finished up in the Climate Committee, and you were in on several occasions. So thank you very much for all your time. And I would like to thank all of you for giving up your time to come here today, because this is a hugely important body of work for this committee. I know we're only at, at the pre-leg stage, and we'll come back 
back to us many times, but we want to try and make it as robust as possible going forward so that the mistakes of the past ca um, can be corrected. That concludes all of our business on today's agenda. The Joint Committee is now adjourned until the 16th of April at 4pm. Gorv Mahagut. Thank you.